So I'd like to welcome you to the second panel in which we will continue to explore the intellectual <coughs> legacy of a great economist. I'm Lars Hansen, and I'm <coughs> here in my capacity as the research director of the Becker Friedman Institute and the moderator of the second panel. As we've already heard, Milton Friedman believed that the precursor to sound policy advice was scholarship. The scholarship provided well reasoned analyses and empirical evidence to understand better economic fundamentals driving the macroeconomy. He contributed to our understanding of savings consumption both from both micro and macro perspectives. He challenged <coughs> and changed our thinking about unemployment. He produced seminal theoretical and empirical work on monetary economics. Since the time of his contributions, economics as a field has advanced, new evidence has become available, but also some of Friedman's keen insights remain powerful. The panelists today will, this, will help us gain a better appreciation for this, uh, for this legacy. So in the second panel, we will continue to explore Friedman's influence on economic analysis and his perspectives on policy, and we will be targeting it towards uh, macroeconomics and, and monetary policy. I'm pleased to have three um, very distinguished panelists that knew Friedman personally and professionally. Um, first, I have uh, my longtime colleague, Bob Lucas. As he's the John Dewey Distinguished Service Professor in Economics and, the, and a former student and colleague of Milton Friedman. Since the 1970s, Bob has been well recognized as a preeminent macroeconomic scholar with pioneering research on monetary economics, policy analysis, and economic growth. In 1995, he won the Nobel Prize in Economics and has a full list of honors bestowed by, by the economics profession in recognition of his unique influence on the field. Ellen Meltzer was my first call, uh, was, was my colleague in my first job in this profession at Carnegie Mellon, which was a great, which was who I have fond memories of. Alan is the Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institute. And more interesting, Alan Meltzer is the Alan H. Meltzer University Professor of Political Economy at the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> His research interests include the uh, history of U.S. monetary policy, uh, the size of government, and the relation of uh, money to inflation. Also, Alan was a co-founder and chairman of the Shadow Open Market Committee and, and served on that from 1973 to 2000. This committee became an important watchdog in the conduct of monetary policy. In addition to his other important research contributions, he's written an important volume on the history of the Federal Reserve. Finally, <coughs> John Taylor, um, I will spare him the comment, Jose's comment about being on the left. Uh, is the senior fellow of uh, is a senior fellow in economics at the Hoover Institution and the Mary and Robert Raymond Professor of Economics at Stanford. John has made many very important contributions to macroeconomic modeling along a variety of fronts. He's enhanced our understanding of how interest rate rules work for the conduct of monetary policy, kind of what they should do and 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 what they actually do. In addition, he served in the government in a variety of capacities, including as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors and Undersecretary for the Treasury of, for International Affairs. In addition to a variety of academic honors, John was chosen the George B. Schultz Distinguished Public Service Award. So, um, so, my, so my plan in, in, uh, run, my strategy in running this panel is I'm going to ask each of these panelists a question. Um, <clears throat> After hearing the answers uh, to, 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 to these first three questions, I will hope we'll hopefully get further discussion among the panelists and in, in, in responses to each other's uh, answers. And at the end of the session, I will follow Jose's lead and open the forum up to audience questions. So my first question for Bob Lucas is, um, as both a student at the University of Chicago and later as his colleague, you had direct exposure to Milton Friedman's insights as a macroeconomist. Of course, fields progress, new data becomes available, what do you see as Friedman's most important and durable contributions to macroeconomics? How do they change the field, and in what ways did they come up short? Okay. <clears throat> I should be standing up for MV equal PY, but, 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 <laughs> but, but, uh, but I'll, I'm going to take another direction, a little more Heckman-like direction. Uh, Milton Friedman had a long, brilliantly successful scientific career, and 10 minutes isn't a very long time. So I'm going to spend my, my minutes on a single book, which we've had several references to already, the 1957 monograph, A Theory of the Consumption Function. Um, it's kind of, it, it's, this particular book kind of illustrates a lot of the things that earlier panelists ha have said in, in a very compatible way. Uh, the book addresses the question, what are the effects of changes in income on household spending? The question had a special interest back then 
because the, the size of the consumption response, the parameter that Keynes called the propensity to consume, was, was sort of at the centerpiece of the Keynesian models of, of the day. So, so it was crucial to, to, to believe that this was a well understood uh, and people had estimates of what this propensity was. Friedman study, which actually came about because three uh, women colleagues, including Rose Friedman, uh, brought him this problem and they were onto this important data set. And this being the 1950s, they thought a man should take over the job and they got the right man. Uh, and, and, and Friedman drew his study of consumption on three data sources. Uh, what, one was the budget studies, which, which uh, Dorothy Brady and, and then Margaret Reed were, were involved in, looking at I income and expenditures across households in, in this cross-section of individual households. Uh, then there were the year-to-year -year time series on, on consumption and incomes from, from national income uh, account data. Uh, and then there were long-term hi historical evidence on income and consumption, uh, uh, you know, 100 years uh, 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 Kuznets comparisons of, of what income, consumption income ratios looked like 100 years ago with what they look like today. Uh, all these sources were, were available uh, and assembled when Friedman uh, uh, started uh, his work on, on the question. Now, only the evidence from the year-to-year -year time series had been employed in, 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 in the Keynesian models. Uh, the, well, the problem was that these three different sources of evidence all implied very different estimates of, of, the, of the response of consumption spending to income, of the propensity to consume. The year-to-year -year time series led to kind of low elasticities that a 10% increase in income would would deliver a 6% or so in increase in consumer spending. Uh, the very long time series, the evidence from Kuznets, said that there wasn't much of a change between the ratio of, in of consumption to income 100 years ago and there was today, which suggests uh, a, a unit elasticity. Um, the budget studies data was a lot more complicated. Here you're comparing not people over time, but rich families versus uh, poor families at the same time instance of time, but you could make the same correlations between income and consumption spending across, uh, across households. And there, the evidence depended a lot on, on the occupation, uh, occupation of, of, of the family, or the head of the family. Uh, some families had, uh, you know, <clears throat> the income consumption ratio looked a lot like the long-term evidence. Sometimes it looked like the short-term time series evidence. <clears throat> so what Friedman did is, and it's very much like this back and forth, uh, uh, his book, to get to the end of the story, his book uh, proposed a, a new theory, a physicist would call it a unified theory, that accounted for the main features of the evidence from all three sources, from a single, a single model. Uh, and, and, and this is carefully worked out and described in the paper. And, and in fact, since that book was written, this, the hypothesis has been applied to many other data sets that, that either didn't exist or Friedman didn't know about at the time he wrote his book. Uh, <clears throat> and the same central idea of the book, which was, as most of you know, that consumer spending is gonna depend as much or more on expected future income as it does on current income. Uh, that same idea can be applied to investment in human capital, investment in physical capital, uh, <clears throat> and, and lots of other behavior as well. So it's a very widely applicable idea. Uh, and I would say the method, methodological lesson for generations of, of, of Chicago students, uh, I mean, I almost didn't get my PhD because I wasn't gonna live up to this standard. Uh, a good theory was gonna have implications, a good economic theory was gonna have implications for, for lots of different evidence. And your job was not to just fit one data set and say you're done, but, but, but to reconcile what you found from your data sets with what others have found with related but different data sets. It's a tough standard. And anyone who's tried to, to, to do it, you, you, you learn a lot. And, and, and as Jim and others have said, it, 
If your theory gets too complicated, too tailored to accounting for a particular data set, then you're going to take it somewhere else and it's, you know, all, all those bells and whistles are going to hurt you instead of help you. Um, <clears throat> so the book has been fabulously influential on me, uh, on, 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 but on other Chicago students, on people all, all, all over the world, as we learned in, in the movie. Um, <clears throat> how has this work stood up over time? Uh, that's a hard question in the following way. Uh, most of our students here and students everywhere learn about this uh, Friedman's permanent income hypothesis from a, a new textbook, maybe Sargent Lundquist or, or you know, uh, and, and, and the advantage of learning it from the latest textbook is that you never learn, you get something about what happened back in the 1950s and of all the developments that have built on that work and, and improved on it in various ways, incorporated new data, all the stuff that's happened since. So if you're trying to learn how to do economics, you want the latest, you want the latest, uh, latest uh, textbook. Uh, so there's no need, in, even if you're using Friedman's work, there's no need to cite him. Uh, uh, work gets that famous and that, that it's just part of what everyone is expected to know. And it doesn't, it doesn't lead, lead a trail that it does when the research is new. Uh, you can feel bad or sad or happy about that, but, but that's the way science works. Uh, uh, the good ideas get absorbed into the, into the common knowledge of the, of, the, of the culture, and the bad ideas, well, who cares? <clears throat> Sherwin Rosen used to say that Milton Friedman had a deeper understanding of the relation of economic theory to evidence that than anyone before him. And, and I, I thought that was a good, good, good way to sum up uh, his career. There's no better place to see this than this 57 book. And his ideas have been developed in many ways. You're right to keep up with the latest developments. But I encourage students, uh, take a look at the book itself. It, 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 it's a rewarding book in many dimensions. Uh, it's, it's just a masterpiece of scientific writing. Thank you. I guess I have that shot. Oh, there it goes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, next, I'd like to turn to Alan. Um, Milton Friedman's research on monetary history is widely acknowledged as highly influential, including his exceptional work with Anna Schwartz. You have pr also produced an important record of the Federal Reserve and have been a close observer of the Fed over the years. How do you see monetary policy during the recent financial crisis within the context of historical experience? To what extent have the important lessons from the past been learned, and in what ways are we ex re-experiencing past mistakes? That's a great question. You know, I thought about what I think about the answer to that question and also as a result of your prodding, what Milton might have said. And I believe, although <clears throat> it was always difficult to predict what Milton would say, that we would have similar criticisms of what's going on now. <clears throat> Milton's book with Anna, The Monetary History of the United States, <clears throat> is, in one respect, a history of Federal Reserve errors. I mean, it, the main part of the book, uh, the part that really had a profound impact was showing that the Federal Reserve simply had the wrong idea about the Great Depression and did the wrong things as a result of the wrong idea. <clears throat> My history picks up where Friedman's left off and goes over some of the same material because I had access to material from the Fed, which they had denied to Milton and Anna. Uh, and that was helpful. It confirmed some of the things that he had said and ex expanded on some of the others. So I'm going to talk about some errors that the Fed has made over time and some that they're making now. And those errors are, I believe, critical. <clears throat> Until the late 1970s, nominal and real interest rates were not distinguished at the Fed. When I was writing my history, I asked Steve Axelrod, who had been a very influential member of the staff 
why that was so, and he said, well, you know, he was a Chicago PhD. He said, you know, I sometimes thought about that when I was working on these things, but it never really paid, uh, we never really paid a great deal of attention to that. That's a fundamental error, which, <coughs> which uh, certainly Irving Fisher had recognized decades earlier. A second error, before the credit and housing crisis, the Fed, to the extent that they relied on any model, relied on Michael Woodford's model, which has a single short-term interest rate and rational expectations. I have no quarrel with rational expectations, but there's no asset market, and there are no credit markets in that model. So there's no basis for thinking that there might be a crisis or where the crisis might arise. That seems to me to be a major error. Third, before the Milton's presidential address, the Fed, along with many other people, denied that the, there was a long-run Phillips curve. Milton's address is just symptomatic of the kinds of things that you've been hearing about today. That is, he looked at the, the data and he recognized there was a fundamental flaw, that just as in interest rates, in all other markets, monetary problems and real problems were long-run distinct. How could there be a long-run trade-off between a real variable like unemployment and a monetary variable like inflation. So he said, wrong. The Fed was very slow to accept that. I'll tell a story about that. I hope I don't abuse my time. <clears throat> Milton had a farm in Vermont right next to his old teacher, Arthur Burns. And when he went up there, he tried in his usual way to instruct Burns about the mistakes that the Fed was making in not controlling money. Well, when Burns got back to the Fed, he ran into one of the other governors <coughs> who said to him, who said to himself and wrote in his diary, Arthur is all confused. He's been up talking about inflation. He's been up talking to Milton. <laughs> the Fed had a real theory of inflation. They believed, like Arthur Burns, much of his talk, it was a cost push theory. That that is that it was being prices were being pushed up by costs. <clears throat> it was a confusion between, among other things, between levels and rates of change. A confusion that Milton would have certainly picked up on. <clears throat> I give the Fed high marks for preventing the payment crisis system collapse. Milton was critical of too big to fail, as I am and many others, and would have loudly opposed the bailouts of Bear Stearns, AIG, and major banks. He was not uniformly against bailouts. Uh, in fact, we had a long discussion about the failure of uh, continental Illinois, where he was in favor and I opposed. But it's an open question. If Bear Stearns had been allowed to fail, would bankers have exercised greatly increased prudence? Would the October crisis have been mitigated, if not avoided? In the 1920s and 1930s, when banks held, when New York banks held 20% of their assets in equity capital, no major New York bank failed. That's the lesson that I have been trying to teach members of Congress for a long time, that the way to prevent bank failures is not to have rules that you like, but to have equity capital on banks graduated according to the size of the bank so that because medium sized and small banks are protected by deposit insurance, which is paid for by, sub, by assessments on the bankers, and large scale banks are not covered in that way, and that's why we need to have, we need to give them the incentive. That's a word Milton loved, and it's a word everyone who studies economics should love. And that is that we change people's behavior through regulation when we change the incentives of the people who are regulated, not by telling them what we would like them to do, but by getting them to want to do the things which close the gap between private and social costs. <clears throat> Milton Friedman would surely have opposed QE2 and QE3 and other actions for four main reasons. First. Buying mortgages by issuing reserves, which is what the Fed does, is credit allocation, and financing long-term debt purchases 
by selling short-term debt is debt management. Those are Treasury government responsibilities, not Federal Reserve responsibilities. Second, he was opposed to excessive money creation. I'll show you some pictures of that. Third, repeating a fundamental old error. The Fed is repeating that error. Current economic problems are real problems. There are real problems. The reason we have lagging growth is not because we have a shortage of money. There is not an excess demand for money that is not being satisfied. There's uncertainty about future tax rates, about health care costs, about labor market changes. Boeing was mentioned earlier, about energy costs, about other regulations. It's very difficult to do a discounted cash flow for your business investment if you don't know what the costs are going to be in the future and you don't know what the tax rates are going to be. And that, in my opinion, is why people are holding billions, if not trillions, of money. Banks hold $1.8 trillion of short-term balances. Corporations hold hundreds of billions. Banks are lending. Show chart one. Is that something I'm supposed to do up here? No, no, up here. Oh, okay. So you can see show chart two. CNI loans at banks are up 12% in 12 months. Milton's favorite monetary indicator, M2 growth, show M2 growth, for the last 12 months has been growing at 7.2% annual rate against real growth of about 2%. Fourth, we have to ask, why is the Fed so expansive and so unconcerned about inflation? <clears throat> there are exceptions. Charlie Plosser is here. He pulls his remaining hairs at the thought of what goes on there. There are three main reasons, all that Milton struggled against. There's, unlike the discussion about permanent income, there's, the Fed gives the excessive attention to near-term events. You can read the transcripts as I did to write my history. It is rare, almost non-existent, to see a discussion at the Open Market Committee in which people say, if we do this today, where will we be a year from now or two years from now? It's all about what's going to happen over the next three months. Should we raise the funds rate by a quarter? Should we keep it the same? Should we raise it by an eighth? Those are the questions which they exercise a lot. Discussions about longer term <coughs> just don't occur. Some examples are 2010. 2010, the market people were yelling, deflation is coming, we're going to have a second recession. So chairman of the Fed went to Kansas City Fed meeting in Jackson Hole and said, well, we've got to ease. But we had a seasonal pickup. Before anything that they had done or even announced began, the pickup began. Is the same thing happening now, January 2012? We've had three years in a row in which we've had summer slowdowns and fall pickups. Something with a seasonal, perhaps. In any case, short term dominates the policy. Paul Volcker, publicly and privately, that is within the Fed, gave up on the usefulness of the short-run Phillips curve. He told his colleagues it doesn't work well, it's not very good for forecasting. When he was talking in public, he was asked very early after he had announced his, anti, his policy to lower inflation, he was asked by Irving R. Levine, a major news commentator on economic events, he asked him, what are you going to do when the inflation rate rises? And Paul responded by saying, well, you assume <laughs> the unemployment rate and the inflation rate are going to go up and down at opposite directions. But the history is that they moved up together, and my policy is going to bring them down together. And he did. And so he preached what was to the Congress, to everyone who would listen, and many people did, he preached what I would call the anti-Phillips curve message. That is, that the way to get low unemployment was to have low inflation and rely on the market process. <laughs>
Unfortunately, that never convinced the board staff and the Phillips curve, short run Phillips curve trade off is certainly a dominant influence currently. <clears throat> when I talk to many of my friends at the Fed, they say, Alan, why are you worried about inflation? All we have to do is just raise interest rates. Well, that's fine. Unfortunately, there's an enormous volume of excess reserves. Show the chart. And there's a problem about outstanding government debt. Forty percent of the government debt has less than two years to maturity. Twenty-eight percent has less than one year to maturity. Interest rates are extraordinarily low as a result of Federal Reserve policy. A three percent increase in interest rates, which would be modest with no inflation, increases government spending in the deficit by a hundred billion dollars. Using one-third as a conservative estimate of the average held by foreigners of short-term debt, because they hold a smaller proportion of short-term debt than the 46 percent of the total debt, means that about $40 billion gets added to the current account deficit in a ye each year. That's a modest estimate because it ignores f the debt held by Fannie Mae, the Fed's portfolio losses, debt abroad, and private debt rollovers. As time passes, the problem worsens. A Congress that hasn't been able to do much about the budget will be faced with $100 billion a year almost right away of additional spending and deficits and an increase in the current account deficit, which is large by historic measures. As time passes, the problem worsens. The average maturity of the debt is four to five years. And I didn't assume inflation, contrary to my belief, of my belief about what is going to happen and what Milton reminded us about too much money chasing too few goods. <clears throat> the Fed announces that short-term rates will remain fixed and that lowers long-term rate. It locks in future bond price losses. We are headed, I believe, for inflation. It could be large. Someone earlier today said monetary velocity was erratic and so on. Please show the chart on monetary velocity as my final slide. It looks like it moves with interest rates. And because interest rates have been low, monetary velocity has been low. And when interest rates rise, monetary velocity will rise. In my history of the Fed, I have a chart of annual changes in velocity and annual interest rates for every year from 1919 to 1980 to 1987, which is when I ended my book. It looks the way it's supposed to look. It goes through the Great Depression, through the war, through all the calamities and good times that we've had. I close with this remark. There have been, in the 100 years of the history for the Federal Reserve, which are now coming to an end, there have only been two periods, two out of the whole 100 years, in which they produced both stable growth, modest recessions, and low inflation. Those two periods were the periods from 23 to 28, when we were on the limping gold standard, or, and from 1985, to approximately 2003 when the Fed more or less followed the Taylor rule. And that's a good introduction to the next speaker. Thank you. Is this on? There we go. <laughs> Milton Friedman advocated the use of simple and transparent rules for the conduct of monetary policy in normal times. The conduct of monetary policy since the outset of the financial crisis has been arguably creative, but this outcome challenges policy transparency going forward. How do, we see how do you see future Fed policy, uh, behavior at this juncture? To what extent is monetary policy alone run out of gas in nurturing a more healthy economic uh, recovery? Thanks, Lars. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I got to know Milton almost entirely from interactions on the West Coast at the Hoover Institution, where he spent many years his place in San Francisco. I learned a tremendous amount from him. A lot of the things I learned were what 
what Kevin and Jim were talking about, also Bob to some extent, this amazing uh, way to link theory and data and go back and forth. I mean, it's, it's a skill which is very rare and you, you almost have to learn it from working with him. But surprisingly, I also learned a lot about just basic policy from Milton, just what really goes on even inside government, the nitty gritty. And I have a little story to tell you about that. In 1990, I was at the Council of Economic Advisors in Washington, and President Bush 41 had this, if you call, recall, revenue enhancements proposal. And one of the things you have to do in these jobs occasionally is call up people and say, maybe we can get your support for this idea and that idea. Unfortunately, I had Milton Friedman on my list of people to call. So I rang him up. He was out in California. I was in Washington. Got him on the phone. I said, hi, Milton. Hi, John. He said, I know why you're calling, and the answer is no. <laughs> I didn't even get the question out. And he said, and by the way, I can see Washington is corrupting you. Get back here right away. <laughs> so he, he knew how to be tough. I want to answer Laura's question by um, going back to the 90th birthday celebration for Milton here in Chicago, where I, I opened with a talk about monetary policy. And uh, the purpose of that talk was to really show how Milton's ideas made things much better in our country when you look back at the past 20 years as of 2002. So 2002 was the 90th birthday. And so I went with charts, and I maybe can use a couple of them here uh, if we get them to work as well. I used charts to show how the U.S. economy performed much better in the 80s and 90s than it had in the past. Inflation had come down, unemployment came down, we had much more stability and, and the volatility had uh, uh, declined. And, uh, and, and at the same time, we had a change in monetary policy. In my view, monetary policy got much more like the kind of things that Milton had advocated. More rule-like, more predictable, more systematic, less discretion, less go stop, whatever you want to call it. And so I linked those two together and said, you know, thank you, Milton, and also gave credit to the Fed for accomplishing this act. And so this first chart is one of the ones I used to illustrate. This is a picture of the inflation rate up until 92, and you can see the, the decline in the inflation rate uh, towards the end. That's when they started adopting a more predictable policy. And I tried to illustrate with this chart the way the policy had changed. And it maybe you can't see the details here, but there's a flat line drawn through that inflation rate at 4%. And then there's two boxes, uh, one in, in 1968, actually, where with an inf inflation rate of 4%, the Federal Reserve had an interest rate of just barely over 4%, 4.8. And then there's a picture that's in the, it's later on in the 80s. Inflation rate's 4%, and the Fed has chosen an interest rate to be 9.7%, almost twice as high. So it's a completely different policy in that dimension. And that policy described what the Fed had done during the period where things were doing much better. The second chart I also used, this is just a replicas from that 2002 talk, just showed you the performance and the overall stability of the economy. So the upward sloping line is real GDP, and the wiggle is the deviations of real GDP from some mention, mention of a trend. And you can see the ups and downs going back to the 50s, but then you see this amazing reduction in volatility during the 80s and 90s when I think, and I think monetary policy along the lines that Milton advocated in general terms was responsible. So there was lots of praise going on. I remember Milton in the first row, lots of smiles. Little did we know then that this wasn't gonna last. In fact, just a few years later, there were signs that things were changing. The Federal Reserve went back to doing those things it used to do. It was, became more discretionary. Um, it didn't follow the same procedures it followed during this period. And I can illustrate that in many, many ways. But let me just extend the first chart I had, and that's my third chart coming up, if we can look at that. So it's taking that inflation rate again, and you can see it, it's come, it came down, it stayed down, it's ups and downs. But I've drawn another line. Uh, now it's, that line is a 2% inflation. 
And then I've shown two places in that line. One is 1997, so that's that good period. The federal funds rate target for the Fed at that point was 5.5%. And then I have another point, which is 2003. Inflation rate's still 2%. The federal funds rate is 1%. It's a tremendous difference. It's a huge difference. And, and by the way, the overall state of the economy is about the same in both cases. So there's a big change. Sometimes people call this too low for too long. Uh, I think of it as a, ch as a change in policy for whatever happened. And it's really the beginning of, a, of really now 10 years of highly discretionary policy, which I think has led to many of our problems. Now, it's not just interest rates, it's other things. So if you look at the, at the next chart, um, let me just skip over that. Just shows you how things got worse. We know you know that. We don't need to look at that to go to the next chart. Um, this is a, a measure of the Federal Reserve's interventions. Alan looked at a chart similar to this. It's the amount of uh, reserves that the banks hold at the Fed, on deposit at the Fed, sometimes called reserve balances. And you can see that was fairly low. For the most, this is a, a period goes back in time, but there's a little teeny blimp, a pimple, pimple blimp. Uh, that's 9-11, 2001. And the Fed intervened and expanded the money supply for liquidity purposes, just as central banks should do. And they can back, get back to normal. And then you see these big movements. It, it began in the financial crisis period. And this is where the Fed provided a lot more liquidity. So it's really now, it's, it's, it's doing its general good job of providing liquidity in a panic. But then it continues. And you can't quite see it too well, but you see if they had withdrawn that liquidity, withdrawn that support to the markets in the same way they did around 9-11-2001, you could see the counterfactual. We'd be back to reserve balances about a normal levels. But instead, you see the blue line expanded and expanded, and that's the quantitative easing, what I call one, two, and now three. And so the Fed has really changed things dramatically in ways that don't really have to do with the panic period. It has to do with a change in policy more generally. Now, it seems to me there's no way you can think of that blue line as anything but pure discretion. We would like to have some rules or procedures to describe how that works, but it is discretion. It's very hard to, to describe it in any other way. I think it's actually quite problematic. And so when I look at this period, the period before the crisis, excluding the period during the panic, because that was good monetary policy, but before and after, it seems to me I have to answer Laura's question is not very positive view of monetary policy. And I think that's, I think that's how Milton Friedman uh, would view this too. Now there's, there's, all, there's other ways to look at this and debate this issue. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, it raises an issue as the Fed had to do this because the interest rates hit zero, the lower bound. And what I've done here to say that, well, that's not necessarily a reason to do all that intervention. For one reason, it's not so clear that there is really an, a zero bound constraint if policy was following the kind of rule that was working in the 80s and 90s. And the red line illustrates that. That's a policy rule sometimes called the Taylor rule. It really not, never got very negative. If you can see that uh, alternative rules, the Fed has their own Taylor rules, of course, and that gave very negative and it justifies the quantitative easing. So you don't really need to think about quantitative easing as being rationalized by the zero lower bound. And I think that's very important. Now, even if it was rationalized by the zero lower bound, suppose the Federal Reserve is right, the gray line is right, and you can't get negative interest rates, so you have to do all this other intervention, then my view has always been what you do then is you don't gun the works with quantitative easing. You simply go back to the old Friedman rule. Remember, the interest rate rules came out of Friedman rules. I mean, it was there. It was meant to be an improvement. If you're in a situation where they don't apply because of a zero bound, you go back to that Friedman rule. And so that's, to me, that's what should have been done. And I think things have been much better if we had done that. If you go to the next slide, um, this shows you uh, how much policy like that was not followed. It shows you money growth. Blue is M2. It's extraordinarily volatile. This is the period, basically the period 2007, 8, 9 until the present. The, it's being generated, those wiggles in the blue line, those wiggles in M2 are being generated by this quantitative easing. So the, the red line is the increase, the growth rate, 
of the monetary base or the growth rate of those reserves. So it's just being caused by those interventions. It's being caused by the financing of the purchases of mortgage-backed securities or the purchases of long-term treasuries. And you have this enormous volatility of M2. I would believe Milton Friedman would be furious about that. If you go to his presidential address, he has this great, it was given in 1967, published in 1968. He has a couple of paragraphs about how outrageous the ups and downs in M2 are in 66 and 65, 66 and 67. They're, they're minor compared to those wiggles. So it seems to me you have a great deal of, should have a great deal of concern about, about monetary policy from this kind of deviating from rule-like uh, behavior. So just to sum up, uh, Laura's second question was, has the, fund r has the Fed run out of ammunition? I don't like that kind of question. I don't think it's true, actually. Because if you, if you believe what I say here, that a lot of our problems, not all of our problems, let's be sure, but a lot of our problems are deviating from the kind of policies that Milton argued, then it can be a tremendous positive for the economy if we got back to the kind of policies that he would recommend. So I don't think it's run out of ammunition. I think you just go back to what Milton said. It would be a tremendous boost to the economy. Thank you. Open up for a, a minute in case the panelists want to follow up on each other's presentations. Otherwise, I will ask a question. Okay. So, um, Alan mentioned uh, some of Mike Woodford's work about uh, and, and and pointed out there's flaws in the models, macroeconomic models, which which are being used to premise mon uh, macro monetary policy on. Um, since the work that you mentioned of Woodford, there's been lots of fast repairs to this work, adding in financial restrictions, adding in a much more, uh, hope, or, or attempts to add in a more ambitious financial sector into this. Um, how successful do you view this as, as a way to repair these models? Are these, are these the right set of repairs, or, or, or do we have to be th uh, rethinking macroeconomics in more fundamental ways? Is that to me? Yeah, I, I think uh, Michael Woodford's work is interesting and well worth reading. I find it unconvincing uh, because <clears throat> the role that he gets, he does put assets into his model, but he does it in a way that minimizes their influence. Uh, a better, if I may say so, a better way of thinking about the problem uh, to go back to the models that Jim Tobin had in the 1960s or that Carl Bruner and I had in the 1960s that had asset prices and credit markets up there in the front. And that, I believe, said <clears throat> that what was important, that you don't want to control, ask the Fed to control asset prices, but the German Central Bank and the ECB, when Ising ran it, uh, <clears throat> had a policy of saying, we want to check up on whether our interest rate control is getting us where we want to go. And the way we do that is we look at the money growth rate at the end of the year. Why the money growth rate? Because it represents a great part of what's going on in the asset markets. Right now, people are leaving money balances to buy speculative assets, to buy, to pay a premium, to buy government index linked bonds, to take risks because many of them, you know, when, when Volcker ran his disinflation, he did it with very high interest rates. And therefore, old people who were living on pensions at least had an income. Now they don't have an income, and they're being forced, many of them are being forced to take risks that they probably would not like to have, and which is not going to be socially desirable outcome, very likely. And we were talking before about the process of going back and forth between data and theory try and develop and test, and get to something you, you could trust. The, the idea you could take a model which doesn't have any role for liquidity at all and put a Band-Aid on it somewhere and, and come out with a model that does have liquidity, that just doesn't respect this back and forth testing process. It just isn't going to deliver. It'd be nice to have the, the, the new, better model, but, but 
you need more than wishing to make it so. So just a brief addition. I think uh, what I'm concerned about sometimes with the, the new modeling, which is very important to do, obviously, is it sometimes is rationalizing the policies that I don't think need to be rationalized. And one example is just take the term structure models. Uh, you know, a lot of us, certainly me, have been teaching you know, term structure models, affine models, for years where quantitative easing would not matter. You know, it's, it's, it's not part of the model. What have we seen since quantitative easing is? New models that try to show why it works. And so I think you gotta be suspicious of that. Do it, do it all you want, let's make sure, get the fact, do what Milton would do, get all the data you can, try to disprove it wherever you can, but it's, you know, I just think there's a little bit of that going on. Um, I'd like to now open this up to the audience for some questions. Oh, back here, oh, the back row. Thank you. Um, so I believe both Michael Woodford and monetary policy rules have come up. Um, and so one monetary policy rule that I believe has been getting a lot of attention recently is nominal GDP targeting. And Michael Woodford has recently um, written a paper advocating this rule. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on such a monetary policy rule. I want to tell you that Scott Sumner is a, is a Chicago PhD from years ago, so if it's a good idea, we get the credit for it. <laughs> so I just say something briefly. The nominal GDP, GNP we used to call it, when we write about, wrote about these things, has some attractive features. It's, you know, if, you, if there's velocities moving around, you move money by the same amount and you get a good constant P times Y. The thing that, um, I think needs to be added to that is what do you do to get that nominal GDP? What do you do with your instruments, the interest rate or the money supply? And going back to Milton Friedman, he, he was insistent that a policy rule was a description of what you do with the instruments. Money growth was, was what he favored. And so he, he basically thought that for accountability purposes, for, because money, money works with a long lag, but it's best to specify the actions in terms of the instruments. So that has to be added. And I think what I would urge people to do who would like to have a nominal GDP goal is to get some of these models out and simulate it with different rules for the instruments and see how it works. But you're going to come back to some kind of rule for an instrument anyway. And so I, would, I just think that has to be done before we really know uh, whether it will work or not. I would say three things. One is, I agree completely with what John just said, that is, you want to give the instruction in terms of the instrument. Second, um, I, at this stage, I don't really care what the rule is, as long as there is one and then it's enforced. And enforcement, I mean, any rule that we have will probably, some will work better than others, but any rule will work better than the discretion that we've had. I gave the two examples of very different rules, the gold standard rule or quasi-gold standard rule and the quasi-Taylor rule. Both of those work better, not perfectly, and there's not going to be a perfect rule, but rules will work better. That's so the second statement is, let's get a rule and put some restrictions on. I think, third, that is absolutely outrageous that the Federal Reserve, which started as a very, an, an organization with very limited powers, now has unlimited powers. It can create as much money as it wants. It can make interest rates anything that it wants. There are no restrictions on it other than those which Congress may, in its wisdom or lack thereof, do something about. But there is no general restriction on what they do. That's a terrible thing to do in a republic. No one should have that amount of discretionary power. Yeah, I, I wanted to challenge uh, Professor Taylor's chart and then bring it back to one of Milton Friedman's basic tenets. You show the accelerations in M2, but as you know, in, ju in June of 2011, the Fed got rid of the last vestiges of Reg Q, and st so banks started paying 
uh, interest rates on checking accounts. And since that period, foreign banks, have, foreign banks operating in the U.S. have lost about $500 billion of financing in jumbo CDs and commercial paper, uh, neither of which are M2, and have transferred them into what are now interest-bearing checking accounts, which are in M2. And those movements account for all of the acceleration in M2 since the middle of last year. Similarly, in late 08, when the commercial paper market collapsed, uh, people pulled money out of commercial paper and put it into checking accounts and sweeps, were t which were temporarily in M2. So my point is, when you adjust for those hot money flows, we've actually seen the most stable M2 growth in the last th throughout the last five years that we've had in most of our history. And it's stable despite massive injections of liquidity into the system by the Fed. So in his monetary history, Milton Friedman was very adamant that in the case of a financial emergency, the money multiplier would be very stable if the Fed provided the reserves. And in this case, the Fed's provided the reserves, and the multiplier basically has gone away. So please, some comments on that? Well, uh, the reason why people have focused on interest rate rules is because of these problems of measuring money. There's no question about it. And you're giving some examples where, where it's sometimes more difficult to measure. Um, the point of the chart here on the, still on the screen, which you see money, that's, that's the M2 moving up and down. But you can see how closely related that is to, to the base changing. It's not the whole thing, but it's a big part of it. And so it's, and the base is not changing to, because of velocity. The base is changing purely to finance those purchases of mortgage-backed, that's how they get the money to buy the mortgage-backed securities. So that, that red line is moving around just for that purpose. So it's driving a lot of those things. And believe me, I would like to say we don't really need to do that now. We basically can use the interest rate rule. But if, if you think we can't because of the zero bound, then I'd say you, you got to do the best you can, which is to try to keep the growth rate of money stable. Don't let it decline. Like the, the lesson from the Great Depression was we let money growth decline. It wasn't that we didn't do quantitative easing and stuff like that. So that's what I think is the lesson, and I wish that that um, could have been done. I, 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 again, I think it is a different time, and we always have to be very careful about, about uh, saying what Milton Friedman would say, because we don't know. We don't know. But I just can't believe that um, someone who paid so much attention to predictability of policy, to worried about volatility of, of the money growth, would... Um, be, we'd like a policy like we're getting right now. A question here. Assuming the Fed keeps its promise and keeps interest rates at zero uh, until the beginning of 2015, um, and assuming there's no significant negative external shock, um, what, I guess this question is for John Taylor, what, what do you think that inflation would be at that point? And if you were put in the charge of the Fed right then, what would you do to, uh, with monetary policy? Well, most likely there's going to be a need to, to raise rates, I think, before then. Um, and so that'll be, that'll be hard. First of all, people expect it not to happen, so you've got to be careful about it and be deliberative and, 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 and if you like, make it gradual, like it's not, so it's not a shock. Um, but I think ultimately, the, fact that the, the disadvantage now of the quantitative easing is you now got to do two things whenever you, do, whenever you have to do it to prevent the inflation. It will have to happen. There's so much liquidity out there. It has to be pulled back at some point. But that the quantitative easing has to be reversed, which means selling all these, and the interest rate will have to rise. So you got two things going on, and uh, engaging in a so-called soft landing is the hardest thing in monetary policy. You don't know, you have to raise the rates at some point in a way that doesn't shock everybody, but either doing that simultaneously with uh, reducing reserve balances. And I think my main suggestion has been lay out a strategy for doing that. So now they say, well, don't worry, we've got all the instruments, we can pay interest on reserves and be okay. But I think people don't know what, how that's gonna work. They don't really have a way to think it through. And one of the reasons is, as you're saying, a lot of people can't see how you're gonna have zero interest rates uh, 
for that long a period, especially if the economy is picking up like we hope it, it will be. So there's a lot of inconsistencies, a lot of the things that would be improved if they could just lay out a strategy. It doesn't mean you start doing it now, but a strategy of how it's actually going to work. I'd like to just say that <clears throat> that question forces you to think the way they do at the Fed. That is, what do I do today that will be good for tomorrow and that sort of thing. My way of thinking about the problem is to say, you adopt the rule and you follow the rule. And you don't ask questions like, what will the inflation rate be six months from now? That's hard to know. Will there be an inflation in the future? Yes. Should we do something about it now? Yes. That's the kind of answer that I would give. I think that's the kind of answer that Milton threw through his life. He didn't worry about what the quarterly GDP or the next six months inflation rate was going to be. He worried about the longer term. The permanent income theory tells you that. I mean, it tells you think about what the future is. Don't worry so much. When Milton was challenged about the fact that he, his framework didn't tell you much about the next nine months, he said, yes, it doesn't tell you much about the next nine months. It tells you about where you're headed and how you're going to get there. You might be surprised to hear me say that I, I agree with you about QE2 and QE3. Uh, I don't think they were a good idea, partly because they haven't worked. We are sitting here with an economy growing at 2% with the gap between John Taylor's trend and where we are actually widening as you, uh, as you showed us. So let's go back to the underlying causes of why we've had such a slow recovery. Now, Alan offered his quartet of uncertainty about taxes and regulation, other sources of uncertainty, and that surely is playing a role. But you also have the, the complementary, but I think more popular explanation, which I would call the Rein, Reinhardt, Rogoff, Bob Hall view, which is that we are still suffering, in Bob Hall's words, the two overhangs, my favorite word is the two hangovers, of the 2008 crisis, namely an excess supply of housing, that caused housing construction to drop by 75% and for housing not to play its traditional role as a leading indicator pulling the economy out of the uh, recession. And the other part of the hangover is the overhang of consumer debt. Consumer liabilities got up to 133% of disposable income from well under 100% uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So we have this overhang. We had a big bailout of the banks, but we have a freezing in the mortgage market due to the fact that banks will not refinance mortgages where the collateral is below the outstanding debt, the so-called underwater uh, mortgages. Uh, do either of you see any role for government policy, whether you want to call it monetary or fiscal or unconventional, uh, to deal directly with some of these underlying double hangover problems? The two most successful fiscal policies of the post-war period were the Kennedy-Johnson tax cuts, which were really the Johnson tax cuts, and the Reagan tax cuts. Arthur Oaken wrote a book analyzing, and since he was one of the principal authors of the Kennedy-Johnson tax cuts, after he left, he wrote a book analyzing where did he get most of the power for the economy. It was from the corporate tax cut. So I would have gone for the corporate tax cut. Instead, you have a president who insists all the time that rich people must keep their money under the mattress because I'm going to tax them and it's not going to have any effect. Well, we'll see. <clears throat> I would say, you know, regulation, there are, we need regulation. There are differences between private and social costs. What we have is very uncertain regulation. We don't know what the regulations are going to be. And therefore, how can you make it, if you look at what is lagging most in this recovery, it's investment. And the reason investment is lagging is because people don't know what the rate of return is going to be in the future, so they hold on to cash. And that seems to me to be a major explanation of why the economy is slow. 
They don't know what the future is. The future is always uncertain. We're making it more uncertain than it has to be. That is hurting us. Second, I would say, we have trillions of debt that we have to service overseas. So we can't, it's wrong to think that the way to get the economy to improve is to stimulate consumption. What we need to do is to stimulate exports. And the best way to do that is increase investment so that we can be competitive. We have to invest in order to pay just to service the debt we have outstanding, not to retire it, just to service it. And that's going to be a big problem, as I tried to illustrate, because when interest rates go up, the servicing costs are going to go up a lot. So just quickly, uh, Michael Bordeaux here, but he's, I think, done research which raises questions with the U.S. context that the explanation uh, that we had this big financial crisis and deep recession is the reason for the slow recovery. Um, that's why uh, I think Alan and I would agree you got to look somewhere else, and when you look somewhere else, you see these policies, which are really the kind of thing they're, they're you know, the temporary fiscal policy things, which we know shouldn't. That's certainly what we learned from the permanent income hypothesis. It shouldn't have much effect, and plus all the other, I, I would call it short-termism. So, to me, the best thing to do is very similar to the points about monetary policy, is to get the rest of the policy back to the kind of things that we've seen worked in that great moderation period. I think that's, that would be the hope we could do. It includes the budget, includes regulatory policy, uh, as well as monetary policy. Okay, with that, I would like to um, thank all the panelists for superb jobs. And, um, and, and on behalf of the Becker Friedman Institute, thank you for attending this event. And, I, and we really appreciate both the expert panelists, but also I want to acknowledge Sunil Kumar's kindness to help uh, hosting this event and booth this afternoon. Um, there's going to be a reception in the uh, so-called Winter Garden. I invite you to go and join us there for further informal conversation. Thank you.